Have you ever been frustrated with your painting because you couldn't get the right color? Or maybe you've spent hours mixing colors only to end up with a muddy mess? If so, then you're definitely not alone. Mixing colors can be tricky, but it doesn't have to be. And in this video, I'm going to show you a simple set of color techniques based on hue, value, and chroma that can really help you improve the colors in your paintings and make your overall painting experience more fluid. Let's first see how we can create an exciting vivid palette for a painting. For this demonstration, I want to paint a subject with a strong red light illuminating the left side of the face and creating a really interesting pinkish red glow. Here's an example of how it looks with my face. If you take a photo to use as your model, it might be a good idea to use the color checking tool on your computer to check the colors you'll need to mix. It can be a great help. As you can see for this painting with the subject and the background, I'm going to need a lot of vivid colors. So here's my palette, titanium white, cadmium yellow, cadmium orange, pyrrole red, crinacridone rose, burnt umber, ultramarine blue, phthalo blue and cobalt teal. It's a lot of highly chromatic colors, but I'll have a lot of effects to create. And a yellow, like yellow ochre, would simply be too dull in this case. So a cadmium, for example, can bring a lot of punch in this composition. My strategy for this painting is to prepare a palette with the most chromatic value scale that I can make. And if needed, dull it down with some type of brown or some type of complementary. Always think about bringing a neutralizer in the equation. In general, the colors on the palette tend to drop in chroma when you start painting, so you always have something more vivid on your palette and it's actually more dull on your canvas. So it's usually a good idea to prepare and mix the most chromatic value scale that you can do first and then see how it works on the actual painting and if needed tone it down along the way. It's always much easier to lower the chroma than to raise it. When talking about composition most people think only about hue but it's leaving value and chroma out of the equation which can be a huge mistake. In this video I just want to go back a little bit and explain what hue value and chroma actually mean and how you can use them specifically to create more visually appealing paintings. So first, what are value, hue, and chroma? Hue is just the name of the color. For example, red, blue, green, yellow, the wavelength. These are all hues. Value is the lightness or darkness of the color. For example, white is the lightest value that exists and black is the darkest, and all the colors in between are all different values of the same hue. And chroma is the purity of a color compared to a neutral gray. It's sometimes called saturation. It's not exactly the same thing, but for the sake of what we're doing here, you can consider that it's the same. A high chroma color is very saturated, meaning that it has a lot of intensity and a low chroma color is much closer to a neutral gray, meaning that it has less intensity. So how can we use hue value and chroma in a composition? Hue is the most obvious dimension that we use in composition. For example, put red and green together or just put yellow and purple together, but it's not the only one. Even though it's pretty useful, it can be used to create contrast and harmony in a painting. For example, you can use complementary colors, colors that are opposite each other on the color wheel to create contrast, or you can use analogous colors, so colors that are much closer in the color wheel to create something more unified. For this painting, I want to play on a complementary opposition with a strong red light in the foreground illuminating the characters from the side, which creates these very strong pink reddish hues, especially for the skin tones. But for painting and composition, don't forget about value. Value can be used to create depth and interest in the painting. For example, you can use a range of values from light to dark to create a strong sense of depth and drama, like I did in this composition with a strong backlight creating a halo or a rim light around my subject 
and a very dark intermediate shadow shape right here. And finally, chroma can be used to tell a story in the painting. In painting, chroma essentially has an exciting role, but you can use it to focus attention, soothe or unify, or to the contrary, create a clash. As you might expect, it's all about balance. Imagine a way scale. On one side, a very dull cutter is placed, and on the other side, a very vivid chromatic cutter. The latter will make the scale way on its side. So to regain balance, the duller cutter has to be the larger one and take up more space. So I wanted to put this into a system and inspired by music, I have identified three main concepts that I use to remember this idea. The tonic, it's the main cutter of the painting. The dominant, it's the cutter that occupies the larger surface area, but it's generally duller. And finally, the accent, it's a small touch of cutter that you can add or remove or change independently of the rest. It's just a small touch of cutter with a small surface area that's just supposed to attract the eye. Hue value and chroma are all important concepts in cutter theory. By understanding these terms and how to use them, you can create more visually appealing paintings. Really, it's something that starts with your model. If you take photos for your models, try to think about using colored lights, using chiaroscuro and high chroma objects to create some visual interests. Don't be afraid to experiment with different combinations of value, hue and chroma. And the best way to learn is obviously to practice. There are no hard and fast rules when it comes to using hue, value and chroma in composition. The most important thing is to use them in a way that you find visually appealing. One super important thing to keep in mind when you want to paint a very chromatic subject like this one is that the local color is the most chromatic one. It means that the most vivid part of the subject is this area here. Not the highlight, not the shadow, this part. Let's take this diagram to understand the relation between value and chroma. It's really it's a tough part of color theory, but really, trust me, it's super important that you understand this. It's part of my color wheel resources that you can find on my website if you want to learn more. Each hue has a color diagram built around two axes. The x-axis represents the values gradated from 0 to 100%, zero being pure black and 100% being pure white. The y-axis represents chroma or hue purity if you prefer, also gradated from zero to 100, zero being completely neutral gray and 100 being the maximum chroma that can be achieved by a cutter. In practice, here's how to use these diagrams. They can be used to visualize how to paint an object of a given hue by representing the shadows, halftones, and highlights. Start by defining the local color of the object, i.e. its color unaffected by shadows and highlights. In other words, its normal color, its natural color. Once you have found this local color, visualize a bow curve that starts with black to finish with white and goes through the local cutter. And this is just how it works. Here is another example with another diagram. The local cutter is here and here is the bow curve. And with this diagram, you can see that the local cutter is always the most chromatic cutter of the object. And then it loses chroma as it gets closer to the shadows and as it gets closer to the lights. When blending colors to make your transitions, always keep in mind that the most chromatic spot is usually around the shadow line but on the side of the lights, between the highlights, the lightest part, and the terminated line or the bed bug line, which is the darkest area, so somewhere here. Knowing this, I often blend directly with cutter, or chroma to be more precise. Here in this case, I don't hesitate to take some pure Pirol red with just the tip of a soft blending brush and feather it directly over the blended edge. This technique is called canvas mixing. I'll blend the colors directly by overlapping the wet paint on the canvas with new colors from my palette. 
and in this case it's the pure red but it can be anything just use a blending brush it can be a soft brush that's already designed to create smooth transitions between colors or simply an old worn out round brush that has lost its pointy tip blend gradually to let the colors merge naturally don't try to blend too much too quickly you want to start by blending a small amount of color then add more as needed it's something organic it has to work spontaneously with your wrist your movement your pressure work with a swift motion try to be very fluid and also use a light touch don't press too hard on your brush when blending the lighter you press the more the color will look like what you had on your palette. And as always, practice makes perfect. The more you practice blending, and this type of blending in particular, the better you get at it. And this technique helps me represent the tendency of colors to be more chromatic towards the edge or the transition, and it allows me to blend optically with chroma, not just with value. It can really help a painting pop and gives a super vibrant effect to the transitions. The final trick I want to talk about is more a precept that you can keep in mind that says that whatever happens in the shadows doesn't really matter. Generally speaking, the most crucial part to paint is the transition, the area that we have talked about before. But regarding the shadows, to be honest, anything goes. If you have a strong chiaroscuro like me, for example, you can let it completely dark and not care about defining what's supposed to be hiding in there. Doesn't really matter. What does matter though is the shape of the shadow, the design of the edge of the shadow. And this is way more important than what's going on inside, which really doesn't really matter. This is here around the edge that everything is visible because it's sort of cut up by the light. It makes the texture more apparent, the grain more visible, the color feels more touchable, it's more intense. Inside the shadow shape, not such a big deal. You can paint and refine it if you want, but keep in mind that a single bold brushstroke will do just as well, if not better. As long as the edge and transition area is carefully painted, what happens inside the shadow shape is not really relevant. All right, that's it for this video, my friends. As always, a huge thank you to everyone supporting my work on Patreon. This video wouldn't be possible without you. You'll find the link in the description if you want to join. You'll also find the links to my courses, my oil painting course, and my color course. That's it for this video, my friends. And as always, joy and inspiration to you.